Have you ever felt that you're becoming a driven man or a driven woman? I think you know the phrase. We use it of people who seem utterly dominated and constrained and compelled by some external purpose so that they are virtually non-existent themselves and have become robots. And uh, I would ask you that question, have you ever felt that you're a driven person? Maybe you say, well, just at times when I'm under financial pressure or when things domestically are a little chaotic or things at uh, the office uh, get a little tight, I find myself dominated or preoccupied with those things. So sometimes I feel I'm a driven man or a driven woman, but not all the time. And then, of course, if I ask you, well, what makes you feel good, uh, you probably will answer, well, I, lots of things make me feel good. Uh, when my family is happy, I feel good. When I look at them and see them happy, that makes me feel good. Uh, when I uh, have a good game of golf and I uh, put in a good score at the end of the day, uh, that makes me feel good. Uh, when my friends uh, are around me and uh, obviously appreciate me and enjoy me, that makes me feel good. And, uh, of course, as you outline all those examples, you can see on reflection that, in a way, uh, they still drive you. <laughs> it may not be driven in the sense of vehement or intense driving or forcing, but so often, much of what we feel inside depends on what people are doing or saying about us on the outside, or about the uh, dependent on the circumstances that we're experiencing on the outside. And of course, you may say, well, I mean, isn't that life? Uh, life is dependent on what happens on the outside. If it's a good day, then it does make you feel better. If you have a good game of golf, it makes you feel better. If if your friends say nice things about you, you feel better. I mean, surely that's what life is about. And yet you know that eventually then that spells doom for us because there eventually comes a time when we can hardly see anybody or there comes a time when what we can see is filled with tubes that are drip, dripping blood into us or trying to transfuse blood into us, or we see the mask of the surgeon who's trying to operate on inoperable cancer, eventually that spells doom for life if we are dependent uh, for our inside happiness on what happens on the outside. And yet so many of us, I think, would admit we are. In that sense, probably it's true that we are all, in some sense, driven people. That is, our inside experience is driven or influenced or dominated or dictated to by the outside circumstances or the people that we're involved with. And uh, that's all right for a while, but uh, there come moments in our lives when we think to ourselves, it would be nice to be free. That is, it would be nice to be free from being always dictated to by outside circumstances or by people around us. It would be nice to be free to be ourselves, to be what we really are. And that's, of course, the moment of uh, truth for many of us, because we look inside to find out what we really are, and we seem so often to find nothing we find that there is nothing in there, that what we have become is a little programmed robot, programmed by the people we know and by the circumstance we, we experience, to be uh, almost a reflection of them. And we discover that there seems nobody in there. There seems nobody at home when we look into our hearts. And we begin to realize that if there ever was anybody in there, if there was a me, if there was somebody that was different and somebody that was a unique personality, well, it's died long ago. And we do feel the words of Wordsworth's poem that uh, uh, the heaven lies about us in our infancy. 
Uh, shades of the prison house begin to close around the growing boy. At length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day. And many of us have found that the you that we used to know, the spontaneous, fresh little human being that used to be there, that had thoughts and ideas of what he should be and what he should do, seems to now have, as we say, grown up and matured and put away those silly ideas. But there's some melancholy in it. We feel, yes, but there hath passed away a glory from the earth. Some of the wonder of the excitement of life is gone, but I suppose that's life. Well, that isn't life. That's half life. That's life going on one cylinder when you should, or going on two cylinders when you should go on three. That's only partial life. And what we have been sharing over these months is that that comes from the fact that we so often live just on two levels of our personality. We live on the level of the body, which can see our friends, which can enjoy the golf game, which can see the circumstances around us, and the level of our soul or our psychological being, which contains our mind and our emotions and our will. And so the eyes see the friends and see their approval, send a signal to the emotions, the emotions are happy, they send a signal to the mind, the mind smiles back at the friends and gives approval to them, and we set up that vicious little circle that goes round and round between the body and the soul. But the level of our being that contains us, that is the real you, the spirit, the part of you that is really you, the part that was made by your maker and creator, unique among all the human beings that he has created over the centuries, that part is dead and has died years and years ago through non-use. You have ceased to use yourself. You have ceased to be what you really felt you should be. And over years and years of compromise and years and years of pleasing other people and years and years of being stimulated by external uh, circumstances, the real you inside has died. And you can no longer find that you. You can no longer find that spirit. Because in actual fact, the... Son of the maker of the universe said that. He said, well, you know, you've died. You've died. Uh, that's what's wrong with you. He said, actually, you're dead in your sins. And, of course, we always think of sin as some terrible, immoral act. Sometimes it is. But sin itself is just acting independent of your creator. It's acting as if there were no maker and there were no person who knew what you were to do here on earth or who had plans for you. That's what sin really is. And that's why Jesus of Nazareth said, you're dead in your sins. He said, you're dead in your independence of my father. And he's the only one who knew what you were to do here on earth. He's the one that designed you carefully to achieve that. And so he's the only one that knows. And you've acted and lived independent of him for years. And so you've now become dead inside. So you can't find yourself. And that's why you have become a driven person, driven by external circumstances and with no real originality inside you. Now, how do you ever find yourself again? How do you ever come alive again? How do you ever find that spirit beginning to live inside you again? Well, you must remember that the maker of the universe has a great interest in that happen. He wants that to happen. He doesn't enjoy seeing you like a little animal. He doesn't enjoy you seeing like a little monkey, uh, seeing you like a little monkey, throwing nuts at the people in the zoo because they all clap when you do it. He doesn't like you being a little performer, a little cookie monster that uh, smiles when somebody gives you a cookie of praise. He wants you to be a real person. He wants you to be the person he made you to be, the man or the woman that he created as an original. You are a one-off. There's nobody like you in the whole universe. And he wants you to be that person. So he wants you to discover yourself. And if you say, well, if he does, how do I come to that? You simply ask him. That's it. That's it. You ask him. That's what his son Jesus said. He said, look, any good father, if his, fa if his child asks him for a bread, will he give him a stone? No, he won't. He loves him, so he'll give him bread. How much more will your heavenly father, who loves you more than your father, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Your father 
your Creator, will give His Holy Spirit, His own original life, to your spirit to make it alive again, to bring it alive again, if you ask Him. That's all you have to do. That's just the beginning. We'll talk about over the next couple of years what's to do after that. But the beginning is just to ask him. Just ask him, God, will you make me alive inside again so that I can sense what I used to sense when I was a child? Will you bring me to life again so that I can begin to find out why you put me here? He will give you that spirit and you'll begin to sense a new life inside you. 